All right. Well, thank you, everyone, and welcome for joining us today for today's training that is part of our AAPI Strong California training series. My name is Elizabeth Merced, the program manager for the AAPI Strong California program at the California Asian Pacific Chamber of Commerce. And I will be moderating this live training today with our partners, Impact Foundry, um, the Sacramento MBDA COVID-19 Specialty Center, and JSR Strategies. We bring you, it's, it's your turn to speak, crisis communications for small businesses. As we know, the past two years have been quite challenging for the nation as a whole, with our small business owners being hit the hardest, um, but we are determined to um, and committed to continuing our work and our efforts to help pivot our small businesses. This crisis communications training will focus on equipping small business owners with the necessary tools to communicate effectively during media interviews. And by the end of today's session, we're hoping that you'll leave with the knowledge to manage crisis communications, handle tough questions, speak in clear sound bites, and appear more confident on camera. Joining us today to facilitate the training is Jessica Rhodes, the CEO and founder of JSR Strategies. And she heads a brilliant core team of senior level marketing and communication experts. And with an MBA in nonprofit management and marketing and experience from her former position as the director of strategy at Threefold, she is a master strategist absorbing dreams and capabilities and transforming them into implementable plans. And if you are joining us for the first time, AAPI Strong California is part of the national AAPI Strong movement led by our longtime friend and partner, National ACE. Together, our goal is to connect AAPI small businesses and their owners throughout the United States with resources to combat discrimination and find solutions together. These solutions have taken the form of these trainings and roundtable series that we've hosted since the beginning of the year. If you'd like to learn more, you can visit calasiancc.org forward slash AAPI Strong California, which will be shared in the chat for you. And before we dive any further, I have a few housekeeping notes. Today's session is being recorded and it will be distributed for viewing post-conference. If you have any questions, please use the Q&A below in your Zoom toolbar. If you have any technical questions, please reach out to me directly via the chat function. And if you have any follow-up questions, please contact me at emerset at calasiancc.org. If you'd like to have your video on, we welcome that. Please stay muted throughout the presentation. Um, and towards the end, we'll have you know, a Q&A or you know, a community conversation, if there's anything that stood out to you during the presentation. And now we have a special message from our sponsors. So let me prompt that for you. Together with the Cal Asian Chamber of Commerce, we're taking a stand with the Asian American and Pacific Islander community, including our employees, customers, and anyone who has been affected by anti-Asian hate. The violence against the AAPI community serves as an urgent reminder that we need to dismantle systemic racism and confront explicit and implicit bias that prevents us from creating a truly equitable world. As we push for progress, Verizon has committed $10 million to accelerate social justice across the AAPI community and joins as a proud sponsor of the AAPI Strong California program. At pg e we have a very long history and a valued partnership with the Cal Asian Chamber. Our mission is to support people, the planet, and the prosperity of California customers and communities. The AAPI Strong California Project's leadership and its focus on anti-bias, anti-harassment, and violence prevention work for AAPI businesses is a model program in California. We look forward to continue our long historic partnership and supporting our AAPI Strong California Project. Supporting AAPI small businesses is one of our core focus because we understand their role in helping local communities thrive. 
Unfortunately, they have been hit especially hard during the pandemic due to the rise in anti-Asian hate and violence. As a sponsor of the Cal Asian Chamber of Commerce AAPI Strong California program, this project will provide the tools they need to speak up, protect themselves, combat bias, harassment, and violence. So as we emerge from this pandemic together, we will emerge AAPI Strong. Thank you again to our sponsors for their support and thank you for being present and helping pave the way for a better and safer future. Now, without further ado, everyone, please join me in welcoming Jessica Rhodes. The stage is yours. Well, thank you so much for the introduction. I'm really grateful to be here with you guys today. We have an a intimate team, so we get to do whatever it is you're looking forward to doing. Um, so I'll tell you a little bit about me, and then I'd love to hear from both of you, Sharon and Regina, if you'd like. If not, I can just sort of march through this as well, but or Elizabeth and Ruben as well, you too. So thank you so much again for joining. My name is Jess, and I'm the CEO of JSR Strategies. We're a marketing firm that does what PG&E does, which is we support organizations advancing the public good. Um, so what do we actually do? It means we write content, we run PR, we help develop crisis communications plans, build websites and social media. And what I really love to do is solve big sort of strategic communications issues. One example is why is the American Red Cross having trouble reaching on people under 50 for certain volunteer positions and how can we crack the code? So that's the kind of stuff I love to do. So I'd love to hear about you what you're excited about um, discussing today. Sharon, you're a leader in this field. Like I'm excited that you're here and I can't wait to learn from and with you unless you're like, you just go ahead and keep on and, and I will. Um, so would either of you like to share um, where you're from and what you hope to get out of the workshop today? And if not, I'll just keep going. Okay, you can jump in any time or also via the chat. I'd love to know more about, you know, what you're interested in. So today we're going to go through four things, uh, managing crisis communication, handling tough questions, appearing on camera and speaking in sound bites. And the last three are important, but for me, the, the biggest prep work needs to go into number one. Um, and that is being prepared for any crisis, being prepared for a communications challenge. And often, we're not, and we end up um, on our heels. Like a tough question will come up or a scenario will come up that, will, that a company will have to deal with and they'll need to start with the bottom three, but I always recommend and, and support, how can you do number one? And it's a lar large part, it's part of strategic planning um, and sort of strategic communications planning. So again, I'll put the question up. What would success look like for you from this workshop? Is there anything you want to handle in, in that list? Or is there anything you want to talk about that's not on that list right now? I love Regina, your burnt skillet. I wonder if that's your business. It sounds like cooking of some kind. I'm interested. Cool. Okay. Well, we'll just keep trucking along and please comment if you have something or a question. So these are the, this is the work that we do at JSR. We only do work with clients that support and positively impact the social determinants of health. So we do a lot of work with values-based organizations. We want to help folks get access to education and quality education. We want to make sure people have access to healthcare and high quality healthcare. Um, we want to make sure your neighborhood and built environment is secure, social and community support exists, and that there's economic stability. So that's these are the companies we work with. And I share that with you because when crises happen, business gets personal. So I'm sharing our direction with you because the core of our crisis communications plan would be our values. What do we value and who do we serve? And how will that relate to the crisis communication team that I choose, the spokesperson I need, the frequency and uh, 
quickness with, with which I respond. And so our values boil down really um, our integrity, quality, improvement, and relationships. And I share these with you because every, every company with really a strategic plan or values network has their list of values. And each of those shift the way we respond. How do your values help lift others up through empath empathy or clarity or service? So I put a little bit more about our values here, um, which you can read if you'd like, but I wanted you to see it because we have back background so that you can, if you wanted to participate and share how these values might change who I'd want on my team, or do these values communicate that I would respond right away that um, how I'd respond. So that might be a little bit too complex, but I wanted you to see for us, we tie in what we do and our values, really our mission, vision, values into, uh, into the whole core foundation of the plan. So yeah, if you have any comments or chats about how this would change how I'd present um, to the media or present in a crisis, then um, let me know. Okay, this is the biggest, most important thing. A crisis communications plan, which I'm sure um, you're both aware of, but I'll reiterate, a crisis communication plan is a set of guidelines you will use to prepare for an emergency or an unexpected event. So it goes over things like, who is your crisis response team? What steps do you take when a crisis first emerges? Which platforms do you share communications with? What are your core messages? What are your messages about this crisis? And how frequently do you distribute messages across platforms? It's also, I think, should have a section about how to communicate with internal and external stakeholders. Meaning, if there's a crisis externally, and you as the communications person recognizes that, prepare a statement, speak to the CEO, and have a whole plan, that plan can be thwarted by not having communications with your internal staff because the internal staff is often who a reporter is going to ask when the sort of uh, professional statement of your media person or spokesperson isn't as deep as they wanted to go. They'll ask your staff. And so I think it is essential to incorporate the types of crises you want to talk with your internal staff on and send them an update so they're communicating externally as well. Because most of us have procedures that say you should not communicate with the media, but often they do anyway. So you want to build a crisis communications plan to ensure information reaches employees, leadership, if you have a board, your partners, the general public, and the media as it's appropriate. The plan is built around a quick release of information and consistent messages. So all of this will change depending on the severity of the crisis, but we'll talk a little bit more about it um, as we go. Let me know if you have questions. Okay, so here's how um, I break down a crisis communications plan. As a strategist, I always prioritize building the strategy first. Um, you could build your team before you build your strategy and your team could come up with your strategy. So these are not necessarily sequential, but they are to me as a strategist. So create a communications plan and understand your potential crisis points. And so for me, this includes an escalation framework, which is a way to identify how serious the crisis is and what actions need to be taken from that crisis. The next step is a crisis management process. And I like to brainstorm scenarios, although I don't necessarily write them down in any sort of public document. Um, so um, that's just a side note. I just like to brainstorm the theoretical crises that could happen. And am I ready to respond to any of them? And the last is understanding your relevant communications platforms. How do you get messages out now? Um, does only the intern have access to your social media account? Are you listening in the community? If something were to happen, do you have connections with those immediate access points? So you could get something up on the website, get something out um, externally. The second phase is building your crisis communications team. Again, this is important because even if you hold all the keys to the castle and you're the strongest person to respond to a crisis, if your team does not know, um, 
there's a huge disconnect. There's a quote, and I'm going to get it wrong, but it's something like the space between what it, um, a lack of communication creates a space, and that space is an, is a wonderful place for fear to grow, and that fear can grow externally, but it can also grow internally. So having a crisis team that you speak to and discuss and tease out events, but also what's your secondary group, and how do you get that information out to your stakeholders? So the two steps of the crisis team are who's on your team and who's on your team under which scenarios. You won't always build a big team. And then establish roles and responsibilities. And the third section of a plan is build sample content and practice your message. So my first few communication crisis communications um, forays as a spokesperson were disasters. <laughs> I didn't know what people wanted. I didn't I didn't understand why the reporter asked me the same question six times. And then when I watched it on the news later, I realized it was sort of to make me uh, look freaked out. Um, and they successfully did. Like they asked me the same question about a fire a number of ways until I was exasperated with them. And I share that with you because that was the beginning of my journey before I was even in marketing communications, but when I was an executive director of a of a firm in town and I hadn't taken the time to learn some of this, which is one of the reasons that I now have a marketing firm is partially because of my failures and successes and businesses elsewhere. Please don't look for it on YouTube is my only, my only ask. <laughs> Just kidding, you can. Um, okay, this is a framework that I pulled from HubSpot's free crisis communications plan. I think it's a great place to start. If you've never used HubSpot's tools, they have classes to teach you how to do um, marketing communications. They have a bunch of resources. One of those resources, if you provide your email and phone number in industry, is a free crisis communications plan structure. And I pulled this as their escalation framework because I think it's just a wonderful way to think about things. In, in their plan, they have four levels of crisis. A level one is the highest level of crisis. It is all hands on deck. Your team is probably bigger for this. You have a clear set of processes that will take place in each of these levels. So I'm gonna to talk to the levels and then if you wanna participate and tell me what you think a level one would be or a level two would be, that'd be great. Cause a level two for me might be a level one for you. So level two is a moderate potential risk or impact on a business. Um, whether that's operations, customer success, or company reputation. Level three is something that's unlikely to pose a long-term risk or impact business operations, customer success, or reputation, but you should still be on the same page. You don't wanna be caught up um, in not being united. And then level four is where most mini crises fall, um, that which are slightly bigger versions of day-to-day -day issues. Um, so like we work with a, a local waste management facility and if they had a mini fire in a facility that didn't harm anyone or didn't um, disrupt operations, but took a minute to deal with in a day because waste sometimes catches on fire, that would be a level four kind of crisis. Any other examples of a crisis that could be a level one that you can think of and you can put it in the chat or you can unmute yourself. Okay, so one, one crisis group that we were on was the COVID response incident command team um, for Southeast Alaska. I don't know if um, any of your businesses brought you to a crisis, an incident command team in that time because COVID taught us a lot about flexibility and how we respond in crisis. And a lot of what we learned about COVID, we were learning as we went. And one of the huge challenges was not having a clear and consistent message from the get-go and no one really knowing where that message was coming from. So that became for, for the hospital system we were working with a level one crisis where we needed to involve not only our staff and our team, but also city and county officials and statewide officials. And how do we make sure the entire state of Alaska is communicating on the same front? So, um, and I believe those incident command meetings still take place, although we have no need to be in them anymore. They're more medical community. Any other examples from the uh, participants that are here of what could be 
a crisis in what might be a level two or level three for your community or your business? Okay, tough crowd. Well, either way, this HubSpot um, communications tool is fantastic um, as a base. If you have no idea where to start, and for those of you that are solopreneurs or have one or two staff and you need somewhere to start with a communications plan, download it and fill it out like this. So what you would do is just download this and um, fill out examples of the types of emergencies that become level one emergencies. Okay, the next step after you develop your escalation framework, because this right here, so I'll go back to this, level one describes what types of examples, like was there some allegation of sexual misconduct? Was there a lawsuit of some kind? Um, did a lower level employee have a crisis in the community that now is reflecting poorly on you? What are the ways that you could be called to speak on the next column, you've got the person or team. And here's where you'll want to have clear responses, um, clear um, people that will be allowed to make responses or meet on an issue. So an HR issue, um, I would use your HR team and or attorneys to respond, but typically they have this a similar response every time, which is, it is our company's policy and procedure to not comment on ongoing human resource um, communication or affairs. That said, there are always nuances. For example, if someone is let go due to allegations of sexual misconduct and is in a, a legal scenario, you'll want to work with your attorneys in order to make that um, work known. Um, so you got to be, you have to know who should be on your team to know how to respond. So this is how you fill this out. Any questions on that? Okay. All right. Well, the next is to create a crisis process. So from the moment you hear something is going to go wrong or something is out in the news, what are the steps you take? What is the step of alert? Who are you calling? And who is deeming the severity of that crisis? Like, is it a level two to your staff, but to you it's a level four? Like who gets to make the call? So somebody calls you if you're that uh, lead team member. And when, when you get that call, you deem the level of the emergency and you activate the designated crisis response team based on that emergency. Again, it says call because this is not something that you always want to be emailing about um, because emails can be forwarded. And I would assume that all email, you should assume that all emails will be forwarded until you get your um, your team wrapped around on a message, I would make this as a phone call. Um, define each response team member by your escalation plan, which is again up here. So if Ruben decides that a crisis is a level two, he's going to call the level two team members under that crisis plan and either set a meeting or let them know the next steps, depending on the next steps in your crisis process. So here you've got an assessment phase. Does the crisis change your operations? Is there an active shooter on site? Is there a facility lockdown? Does, is there a need for an evacuation or isolation? Is there an exposure, medical containment? What, what needs to change in your operations based on the information you have? You know, I'd argue that probably most of those fall under a level one or two um, crisis. And then this activate communications plan is like a deceptively small bullet because each one of them has a different communications approach, which should be the next piece of your plan that you're writing. And that's under activate. What is the way you're launching your plan? In each of these four levels of crises, crises how do your communications work? Where do you post? What's the message? How do you respond? And so this activate, draft an internal brief statement. And I would argue to do this even prior to that first meeting. So whoever gets the call about the crisis and deems the crisis a level two and makes those first calls, that's immediately when I would put together a who, what, when, where, why, factual information, what we don't know, 
and a draft quote from whoever the spokesperson is or leadership on the team in relation to the crisis itself. Then I would put an honest assessment of a timeline and when an update will be forthcoming because it is okay to have an update that says we are looking into this, then it goes into your values. We are looking into, into this. It is our it is the most important value of our company to make sure our customers and staff are safe and protected. We will reach back out at this time with more information. That way, if someone calls you for a quote, you know exactly how to respond to showcase that you're experiencing the urgency, that um, you're working to get them the information that they need, and that you're collaborative. Any questions on this? That's quite a lot in one slide. <laughs> okay. So in the chat, if you're willing, what are some examples of a crisis that could occur within an organization? Or, you know, you could, asking for a friend, you could say things that might come up you're worried about or things um, you might want to prepare for. And if this is hard to think through, I'll give you a list of types, <laughs> of types of crises that you could deal with. And you might be thinking, hmm, a lot could happen under each one of these. Like one could be as simple as um, sharing, it could be as simple as um, making someone unhappy on Yelp because of an actual mishap. Um, or providing food to the, like a food someone's allergic to, to them, even though you said it wasn't and then getting sick. Like those are, those are, we're getting rapidly more higher escalation. Um, lawsuits can come that you are presenting, like that you are suing or coming after someone else or that they are coming after you. Accusations can be made for your company. Uh, and their processes and policies. They could be made of your executives. It could be made of your managers or an employee at any level could have a major offensive statement or action. And I put these up there because it's helpful when you're going back to that crisis. If you go back here to look at what kinds of crises you want. Um, I would always under, under accusations, you have, there's a lot of space to put sort of, uh, human resources elements. So from these, I would recommend you draft a boilerplate content. So it, you will not use it every time, but a lot of crisis teams end up wordsmithing excessively. So it's nice to have things like I was saying something like, um, Let's say someone has been accused of sexual harassment at your facility. So saying something like, at our company, at your company, the name of it, we believe that, and then you include a value, something like, everyone should be treated with respect. We stand with anyone who has had the courage to speak out if those values have not been honored. We're working to create a safe and inclusive workspace. We are swiftly um, reviewing these claims. We cannot offer any um, further information on a human resources uh, issue. Here's some resources within our company. And that internal message, maybe that's an internal message. So you're telling your employees, if you want to come out and tell us more, if this person has sexually harassed you without naming them, without dealing any with, with passing this completely through all of your HR people and your um, attorneys, but allowing more people to come forward. Externally, your message might be a little bit different, but you can see how I'm even talking through this. I'm pausing because every word is so important and all of, all of the potentials deserve really thoughtfully written out examples that align with the values of your company. What do you do, for example, if someone dies within your facility? Maybe it's only an in internal communications, but how do you share that information? What happens if you lose a CEO? 
um, or your CEO unexpectedly resigns. I recommend you think through some of these and draft sort of boilerplate language and have your general counsel and human resources team look at it. Now, it's gentle because you don't want to show the CEO you're working on their unexpected death and loss and, and removal, but it is smart to have a plan ready so that you can focus on practicing your questions and answers for that plan instead of working hard just to get the facts into, into a paragraph. Oh, there's some chats. What's going on in the chat team? I can't see it anymore because I'm presenting. So Ruben or Liz, oh, there it is. Oh, Sharon. Yeah, um, so we have um, two questions that just came in. One's from Sharon. Uh, and the question is, what's an example of a poor crisis management you've seen recently outside of your own firm? Uh, and can you critique a real life example such as Facebook? <laughs> well, I love, I love the tee up of the example. Um, I'm going to think about that one for a second. And then the other question was, how has communication, crisis communications changed with the fast pace of social media or disinformation? This is a huge question. So that I think is constantly evolving. Um, some ways social media has made it easier to connect with reporters. So it's easier to develop relationships and maintain them on a broader scale for a company. So where you used to just know the two reporters that you'd interact with on your local beat or your local chamber, now you can interact with lots of them. So that's a really different interactive world, which has been really exciting um, to be able to say like, I see you're publishing the story or you're public. I'd like you to see if you could retract this section that won't always happen, but that's been a positive on the business owner side. Social media is a strange place for commentary of any kind. So um, you can't expect social media is not the place where you put a post out and people are generally positive, whether that's about vaccinations or your COVID protocol or any crisis, it's a challenge. But a lot of companies use their social media as a tool to showcase their transparency and closeness with the community. So I would say writing your social media into your crisis communications plan is essential if it is part of your strategic plan that you use these channels. If it is not, and I'd say there's, there's an element of you cannot control messages in every way. We use a listening software called Critical Mention. It's one of many listening softwares, but it listens on radio, TV, newsprint, and social media for on public accounts, which is again, a limitation um, for uh, any negative or positive sentiment or neutral sentiment about um, what's going on. It's really smart to be monitoring that and using that kind of listening software, which is fantastic and quick in order to keep developing your responses. So if you have a general blanket response and you see that the community is reacting poorly to that, how can you modify the questions and answers or modify the frequency of your communication based on that sort of rapid real-time disinformation and engagement? And there are some crises that are bad and that the correct directive is apologizing and um, committing to take future action and then letting that time blow over in the community. And sometimes you can't avoid that. Now, it's interesting you put, what is an example of poor crisis management I've seen? Outside of my own firm, I appreciate that. <laughs> um, sorry, I'm getting stuck on my own examples. Um, I believe that I think your example of Facebook is really interesting. Sorry, someone rang my doorbell, so my dog is going to get excited for a minute. Um, Facebook's leaking of the information that Instagram is targeting youth in a certain way, to me, shows a disconnect with their external facing strategic plan and values and their internal facing strategic plan and values. So to me, there isn't a way crisis communication could have been done better because the problem 
was a values misalignment on an internal team, um, which is again, why I think a plan is so important. And that plan has to integrate with PR and has to integrate with um, uh, the, the business as a whole, because there's really no way to manage a communication if what you've done is, is communicate to employees that they're secretly doing this work, um, but we can't tell anyone about it. That is for sure going to leak. So I don't know, maybe I get lucky and get to do all the work with nonprofits. So, so our, our communications are a little bit different than that, but that was definitely what I saw. And I witnessed internal employees really struggling with the weight of that, of what it meant to work at Facebook, what it meant to work at Instagram and um, more of them defecting, more of them communicating. I hope that helps, Sharon. And if you want more, just, you know, keep chatting, keep chatting with me. Appreciate that. And Kenji, you said social media accusations and negative and false comments. This is where I think that escalation plan is really important. Um, you know, we work with a, um, some energy sustainability companies and probably six to 12% of their entire market is never going to align or believe them. So we get a lot of social media um, commenters that don't believe in government, want to live off grid, just have sort of uh, accusations that don't have much basis. But that is what we have. We have a pool of, a let's say, 100,000 people and 10,000 of them are, are going to never be converts to our group. But it is part of our... Um, strategic plan to have transparency and openness and engagement with all on that social media platform. So part of our social media plan and strategy includes how we deal and support the community. So that isn't necessarily a crisis communications plan, but it is the community management plan within our social media plan, if that makes sense, Kenji. It's, um, if that's okay, then I'm using your first name because you just messaged me. So thank you. Um, so social media accusations, I would write by tier the same way I would do this. So I'm, I'm even going to go back a couple slides. This, we write them by tier. They're not so serious, but level one is somebody uses profane language or attacks a board member. And when we do that, we hide the post. And what I like to do is publish on social media that that's what we'll be doing. Level two is someone makes misinformation um, in a way that's really damaging to us that we need to comment to. And then I pre-write comments, although when I'm not trying, you have to be gent gentle and careful that is the comment rational? Does it use facts that are unclear? Or are you walking into sort of a tit for tat argument on social? You gotta be careful. Um, Level three is someone asked a question, how do you respond? Level four, um, yeah, maybe that would be a level four. I don't know if that helps um, with that social media accusation question. Sharon, great question. How do you communicate a disconnect? Oh yeah, no problem. How do you communicate the disconnect with a board or CEO? At what point would you walk away from the account or do you? That is such big important question that I think we should you know sort of ask ourselves about life so I really love that Sharon thank you for thank you for um adding that and I'll read that in a second May but um for us I have to go back to this integrity quality improvement relationships I understand that every client I have isn't the best and we're not the best we're improving we're always trying to be better is the issue does the issue continue to support this realistic strategic plan goal that I have, which is to use my company to advance the social, the positive impacts of, so, or to reduce the impacts of social determinants of health. So giving access to more BIPOC individuals, um, um, access to education, healthcare, et cetera, or bridging the socioeconomic gap to like close the gap so that people have more access to, again, education, healthcare, economic stability, like improving our our world and community. If the crisis they have done does not conflict with the mission that they have done here, I would, I might continue to do the work, even if the problem has been an internal problem. So if, let's say, 
I, I, this is so hypothetical, but let's say a company we worked for had the same problem that I just talked about with Facebook, where their internal HR processors were different than their external. And I had to present from the external side, the best thing I can do, it, as long as I believe this company that is not Facebook is still contributing to the healthcare and, and quality and, and equity, um, and that the crisis doesn't fundamentally negate that. For example, like Volkswagen's crisis with Dieselgate was a fundamental problem that within that crisis communications and, and subsequent lawsuit, they've turned into a fantastic or a more fantastic community benefit program through Electrify America. Like, so within crisis, there is opportunity for immense growth. So this is kind of an exciting moment. Um, but if that alignment wasn't there, then yeah, I think I would walk away. Um, I think I would walk away from the account and I'd probably try endeavor to write that into the scope of work or agreement. Like here are the cases where we're not going to meet you. And here's the cases where you can't meet us. And so here's your 30 days. If, that, if that's helpful. Um, okay, May. Recently, we had a death take place at an event that involved several organizations. The person who passed was a participant but we were taken off guard when the incident occurred. I'm so sorry that happened. That's really hard. For smaller organizations like us, and in the absence of any clear protocols or process for response, where should we look for some sample protocols? Our HR department is limited. That's a really great question. This, um, at the bottom here of this slide, it says HubSpot's free crisis communication plan. They are not the only one. But they also have like short video classes that your team um, can use. So if you download this plan, and again, they get your email. So like, I don't work for them. So I'm sort of bummed that I'm telling you this at all. And I don't have one for you. But um, if you download this plan, you have to give them your email and stuff. But it'll have sort of an outline and mock content that you can use in situations. Do not use that exactly, but you can take, it has like a whole slew of, here's what you might say if you had an unexpected loss of somebody. And I think it is important at like use this scenario for your company to highlight the top four things you do want to have communications around. Because I imagine um, your event was designed to bring community together. And when a loss happens, whether or not you should respond, you should know what you might say should you need to. For example, if it was at an event and there's no reason that you respond, um, I think I would stay away from it. Um, if, if in doubt, I would stay away from it unless it really is core or essential to your business or presents a, a potential risk or impact. Now, that said, if you are, if the core of your business is speaking up or giving a voice to the voiceless, then I think you do need to take this level of one through four and expand it more. Awesome. Yikes. Okay, scary. Thank you. Thank you, um, May. That's a really big deal. Okay, any more questions? Thank you so much for the chat. It's like so much more enjoyable to be here with you guys and to hear what you're needing because you're not alone. I think that's a really big, big deal is all crisis communicators and reporters are sitting and figuring out how we grapple with, you know, the space left by an emptiness of information that causes fear. We just want to reduce that fear. So another step in your communications plan, which we sort of started to talk about with social media is what communication platforms are you going to use? And that's a, this is a great moment as well. Like you're not going to put that information about the death on social media. But where, where do you find the next of kin's data? Where, where is that located? Is that in a database somewhere? How do, you, how do you resource that? So I broke this into sort of marketing jargon that you, it doesn't matter. You don't have to use. But in your plan, if you wanted to break it up like this, it can be helpful. Um, owned media is, do you have a website and landing page? At what, do you have a news page? At what point would you use that? Do you have collateral and signage on site? If, for example, you have a facility shut down, what, um, I mean, you don't want to scroll that in hand, handwriting and like tape it on the, the door. It's nice to have some of this stuff organized. And so as a former executive director and a small business owner, I understand what it is to not have enough time or resources to do everything. What I'd recommend is 
can you look at that plan or a plan you download and say, I'm only going to tackle this for 15 minutes or one hour every other week, but I'm going to do it for a whole year. I'm going to get these things done. Maybe I'm going to make a sign in Canva that I'm just going to save, like facility closed, Laura Mipsum, like with some just basic information on the bottom. Please contact this for more information. And if you ever need it, you have it. And that's, it's, it's the hardest to be proactive when you're a small firm, but it's possible for you to be reactive. And it takes more of your staff, more of your time, more time than it would have taken to be proactive. So any chance you can get, if it's an hour a month, if it's an hour a quarter, what's the way that you can be more proactive towards building a crisis communications plan? Because crisis communications is about customer service and connection, which many of our businesses require. So own media has promotional materials, press releases, internal communications. Again, every email you send via internal, expect to be sent out. So you, you need to like think through your communication, um, direct mail, emails, and e-newsletters. Then you've got shared media. So it could be your channel. You could own your Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, Nextdoor, TikTok, which I didn't put on there, YouTube. But others might also share information on there. So you, you do really want in um, a way to listen. So like I said, we use critical mention um, and they are typically the database software that most listening platforms use and they'll ping you whenever um, whenever uh, you hear about a crisis. So I think part of part of this is part of this um, uh, grant funding allows for you to meet with me if you want. Um, for an hour. And if what you wanted was if I pulled or sent you emails from a critical mention from that hour, instead of meeting with me for an hour, I'd be fine with that. So if you want to email me, I can sort of get you on what that could look like, which will be a nice service to you if you need. So um, JSR Strategies is my company. You can go to our website and I'll have my email at the end. But if you'd like me to like look for your organization's name in the news for you know a quarter or a little bit longer and just send you anything that I see, I can definitely do that as part of a service. So let me know. And that includes earned media, which is media um, coverage, um, or I also put partnerships or events. Um, I think May's question was a good one um, about like what happened. There were 20 organizations or 15 organizations. Who Who is in charge of that? And um, I think, and what are they saying? And are we all saying the same thing? Um, and then there's paid media, getting your information out via a paid net, which is sometimes appropriate, although a little strange um, in a crisis situation. Okay, the next uh, phase. How would you advise businesses being adversely impacted by homelessness, people camping? Wow. Sharon, big questions. They want people removed, but don't want to seem heartless to the greater community. I think it would depend, my answer would depend, am I the business, am I the P-bid, or the bid that's managing that area, um, am I a nonprofit um, supporting um, ways to get people homed or uh, homeless rights, because um, each of those groups have a different crisis communications plan and a different strategy. Um, your question is a fantastically philosophical one um, that I think deserves to be answered, but I might not be able to answer directly. I guess what I'll say is if the business's plan, let's imagine, yes, let's imagine small businesses, people are feeling maybe afraid to come in because of um, folks out, outside, or maybe there's ex people experiencing crises outside, like, like mental or emotional crisis, um, but you still want folks to come into your small business or your church. Um, how do you deal with that? Um, so I would say, are there places you can work with? So some communities are part of bids. So you could call like Midtown Association, not, not many businesses are part of that, or you could call Downtown Partnership or uh, Del Paso Heights Partnership and ask for public safety support on specific thoroughfares that relate to your um, entry and exit of your um, clientele. Um, and if you don't have access to that, that sort of puts you in a more interesting position. I would chronically work on, or I would prioritize work on how to make the situation safe and healthy um, and as equitable as possible before I would make an external statement 
unless that statement was to support some legislation or uh, policy advancement. And then I'd be think really carefully about where that statement was going. Because you're right, it, it's just, you don't want, mostly if you're a, a, a small business owner, you don't want your name to be associated with homelessness or, or the fight uh, you know, against or for homelessness. You don't want that. So how do you use how do you use this crisis to build your internal partnerships and develop safety and equity or safety uh, in alignment with what you need? And I know not everyone has that. Like a lot of folks are left outside of networks like that and have to rely on police activity, which is a strange um, reality. And that's, an, that's like a next level operations task that I think uh, I would pull in my ops team. And if I had someone from the police force that I could talk to about the importance of my business if it is a church in the region like how essential that is as a community center how we need youth to be able to come in and stay off the streets or whatever the church does um, churches have been you know I grew up in Mississippi so churches were the like beacons of community safety so that would be my first step before I made an external statement uh, I hope that helps so develop your incident response team who is your first line of defense? Who's on your core team? Your core team has to be people with connections, understanding, and confidential access to information. Thank you. Um, this is essential because you have to respond quickly. So is your internal core team so small, small enough to get that first me message out, which is an incident has occurred at this time, at this place, and has resulted in a closure of this facility, we will get back to you with more information as it comes. And then your next core team is bigger because you don't want 10 people on your core team asking questions of, well, why was the door open? And what do you mean someone walked in? And because you don't have time to, to go into that level of question when the response is needed immediately, but you do need to go in those questions. So it's almost like I would build a core team of three and then a bigger core team that you needed, including attorney, including HR. Um, that way you could explain to people or, or places or groups why a scenario happened. And from their question, you make a question bullet because you better expect that a reporter is also gonna ask you that same question if they did. So I would, I would use your core team's questions to build out your talking points. I'd always um, designate one crisis management lead person and this person should be able to take, you know, don't expect them to always work a full-time job and be on call for all crisis 24 seven. That is a hard reality. So having flexibility and like, you know, mental health breaks for that person is essential as well. But they would direct and coordinate all aspects of an organization's response, including uh, messages and media. Be ready to get, if someone is doing this for you and it is a 24 um, seven work for a few days, make sure they get food make sure the executive assistant on your team gives some access to stuff. And I only say this because our team has run this before. <laughs> make sure you care for those people because you need them to be the most calm and most grounded out of anyone out of your team. And they might not need you to feed them, but we're, we're pretty nurturing like that. Everyone needs to bring me snacks constantly. That's just what you got to know if you work with me. Um, great. And then you can have someone that um, is a designated spokesperson that's different from your designated crisis management lead. I'm more of a lead than a spokesperson. I tend to stammer a little. I tend to um and uh, and that makes me sound like a non-competent spokesperson, but I can be a stop. I can support the, the spokesperson really clearly. And so you might in your company know, you might be one in the same, or you might know you're the speaker because what you like to do is sit back and wait and you don't feel the need to fill the hole. And I do. So I know that I am, I can be a crisis management lead, but a spokesperson is not generally my bag of tricks. Um, and then, you know, know if you need to create a greater response team. Sharon's question was a wonderful one. Do you need a member of the police force? If you do, then you should be cultivating that relationship constantly over the year. What are great things you can, you know, do to include them in your mission? How can you have them feel like part of your community? That's just a wonderful way to grow your response team. You want everyone who has your back to have your back and you to have their backs is essentially because a crisis really um, relies on relies on that okay sort of running out of time but i'll get through this as much as now it's sort of the easier part which is tough questions 
um, being on camera, speaking in sound bites. So we'll kind of move through this quickly. Um, let me know if you have questions again. Okay. Here's my three things that I've learned from, you know, failures and success. Always tell the truth. You do not want to be caught in a non-truth. Oh, hi. Hi. And if any of you have any other things to add, please do. So always tell the truth because the reporter will find the facts later. If you do not know the answer, say so and say when and if you can provide an answer. The second, and this is my biggest failing, is understand that an interview is not a conversation. So expect to be interrupted. Don't be lulled into having an off the record conversation. Um, have a, you can have an off the record conversation, but do more listening. Um, don't ask, like ask for questions written if there's time to do things. Um, act as if everything is on the record because it usually is. Um, you'd have to have, you have to have sort of a strong relationship with the reporter in order to feel comfortable. But even then be prepared to always be speaking in the messages you've been given and prepare in advance. You can often anticipate the difficult questions, rehearse your responses aloud or with a colleague. Um, you don't want to sound like a robot. So you want to make sure you're not, you're not um, repeating the same phrases with the same intonation. So practice, practice, practice. Awesome. And the next one, I'm sharing this staying on message. I'll share the first one, which is called bridging. Um, not many reporters like this and not many people like this. So you have to be careful when you do this. It's stuff like if someone asks you a question and you want to avoid the question and bridge to your answer, saying something like what's important to remember or let's not forget or let's start at the beginning. But this makes you look like you're evading the question. So I would say if you need to use bridging techniques, if someone asks you a question you cannot answer and, and you know you have to avoid because board or management has not given you the tools, but you cannot call them out in public for that, you can use what is called the bridging technique. It is patronizing. So I don't like to, again, recommend this as much as possible. Um, it is always better to get the answer. So if that's something like, what is the company going to be doing from now on about this procedure or protocol? I would love to be able to say, we've developed a, a response team to investigate this. It will take six months for that investigation and uh, blah, 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 blah. Like you want to know the answer, but if you don't. Um, the second is reframe the question. Um, so if they've asked you a question that is open, how can you um, either ask for clarification. Um, you can ask things like, why do you ask that? Or if there's an accusation in the question, you can say, who's making that accusation? It doesn't have to, um, you can have um, some back and forth in conversation. You can also question the appropriateness of the question, especially if someone is trying to make a level four crisis look like a level two because they're expanding it with what's happened in the region. So you can question the appropriateness of the question um, if it's factually inaccurate. I think you need to be ready to decline to answer because as our crisis spokespeople, we're not always the people in the boardroom and we get influence and impact from them and we don't always know the answers. So I cannot um, answer right now, but I'll do my best to find out more information for you. You can answer the question partially, but be prepared for that. Um, and be prepared to say the question covers old ground if you've already answered it and they're just asking it again and again in order to get you to respond a little differently. Um, this house, I took this picture from somewhere and I have it and I have the like the, the source in my notes, but not on this PDF. So I'll get that to you if you publish this so that I'm not taking any photos from people, but this is a core message house. Um, and it basically says, do you know the fact, like how, what are you gonna say when it comes to a, a, a crisis response? Um, Cause really you don't wanna say more than the facts that you know, and you want those to be as short as possible or as concise as possible. And so I have on the right, you can see it's the umbrella statement at the top, core message one, two, and three, and then whatever evidence proof points or support. I love using this tool because usually when a crisis happens, if you've got three people at the table, that's your incident response team. Some of them have 
feelings and prejudgments about the question in general. Like, I can't believe they're asking that. Like, don't they know we've been serving this community for 45 years and the serving the community for 45 years, that like frame makes them sound frantic and not really address the crisis that's now. But under the evidence and proof points, we can say we've been here for 45 years serving the community in this way. Um, any misstep is essential and important to recover from, blah, 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 blah. So having an umbrella statement like, um, we can't respond to human resources requests. We have core message one, you can rephrase it in a separate way if you want, and then you can say evidence. It is our policy and procedure. Sorry, my dad is again excited, dancing around, you can probably hear. Um, yeah, provide evidence for each of those things. Or let's say there was a fire. A fire occurred at this time in this place, and um, the facility was shut down for this many hours. What are the evidence, proof points, and support for that? So that's a message house. Have any of you guys worked with that before? Work with a structure like this? Cool. It's, re it's really helpful because it makes you see like, oh gosh, I'm trying to answer two things at once here. The core message here is this. The second message is this. Try not to have more than three umbrella statements for any crisis. Like that just is a lot. Um, and then the last is to brainstorm questions. So put yourself in the mind of the reporter or your, your most important customer. What is your most important customer going to say? And then what is your biggest naysayer going to say? What are they going to ask? Which questions do you want to answer? Because some of them you don't want to go into. And then practice. Do your, does, your house, does your house answer those questions? Or do you need a second umbrella statement? Am I running out of time? Elizabeth? We're at 2.03. And when do I need to stop talking? Um, 2.25 works. Okay, I'll keep going. And just keep, we have a question answer period at the end, but it's kind of like they're being asked in the, um, now. So feel free to keep going. <laughs> Appearing on camera in crisis. Um, this is really important. Um, appearing calm, serious, logical, human, empathetic, confident, matching your company's values, match, being transparent. The strangest advice I've ever gotten that was helpful for me was to wear comfortable shoes. Something about like the way people hold their jaw when they're wearing uncomfortable shoes. They might not, you might not realize, like you might feel, you know, powerful in certain shoes. Sometimes I have some heels that I really love to feel powerful in, but when I'm being videotaped, you can see that stress in my back and shoulders and face. And so um, wear comfortable shoes has been great feedback, but that's a little like flippant. Um, I think it's important um, to know what you're going to say and to appear with that um, empathetic, calm, logical, confident, source. You don't need your most charismatic person being your crisis response team member. You want the one that instills the most trust. Your messages, I think, are powerful and doesn't have to, but powerful when you use language that humanizes like we, us, our. It's powerful to be repetitive and clear. Like we said, space invites people to ask more questions or get nervous you don't have the answers. So if you've given a response and you're at a podium and you're responding like continually and not just in a Q&A format, it's smart to repeat that information two or three times so that somebody can feel like, okay, I heard the, the facts once, but they didn't sink in. Okay, they're sinking in a little bit more on the second. Like, okay, I'm sort of getting it on the third and I'm trusting this person because they're saying they're repeating themselves and the story is not shifting. You can see I speak a lot with my hands. I don't think that is the best action in a crisis. Um, you want to stay subdued, again, confident, calm, logical. If I had, if I was a spokesperson, I'd probably have to like put my thumbs in my hands because otherwise I would probably make people uncomfortable. Again, why I'm not the spokesperson. Um, sound bites. How to speak in sound bites? What is a soundbite? So for those of you who are smaller businesses who might not think about this, a soundbite is what a reporter takes and puts on the TV or on the, in the print piece or in the newscast. And so um, it's their job to make a story interesting and understandable and provide a perspective from your quote, 
they didn't already find. So a lot of your, your like practice statements will be things they've already written they, and they don't need to repeat like we've been in business 45 years and blah, blah, blah. They don't want, they, they don't want that quote from you. Um, and there's, you know, when I started doing this, I looked through a lot of uh, mentors and resources. I have my MBA in marketing um, and nonprofit management. So we had classes on this, but um, there is this fantastic YouTube clip of a guy that I can find for you as well. If you're interested, send me an email where he says, all reporters in every language are looking for speech patterns. They're either analogies, they're bold action words, they're cliches or humor or pop culture references, rhetorical questions, absolutes or examples, specific examples. And I bring this up because look back at your house and choose which ones you want. And like humor is not appropriate in every situation, in many situations um, around, revolving around crisis. But are there bold action words like this crisis we take extremely seriously and any accusation will be acted on immediately? Those are the types of quotes that will be pulled into a soundbite. So from your talking house, but I would look at in your responses, choose the one or two you hope get repeated in the news and make those the ones with the bold action words or specific examples, because they want to show personality of your company and you and perspective that they can't get um, by writing it themselves. So you can kind of guess which quote they're gonna use from you if you use your talking house messages and look at them from this lens. And then I'd say, keep it short and simple and you have to remember it. So if you're a memorizer, it's 15, 30 or 45 second bites, longer than that, it's just wild. And imagine they're not gonna pull all of that. They'll pull whatever they want from it, but um, having it in memory is helpful. Okay, and then I have this conduct a post-crisis analysis. I think this is important and this is, um, this is what May was talking about. Um, the post-crisis analysis would be something like, did we respond quickly enough? Did we address basic needs? Were we um, human and did we provide care? Did we show empathy for people impacted by the crisis? Did we live our values? Were we honest? And this is such a big challenge for um, sort of empathetic people. We want to give the facts, but then we want to say, but I'm sure it'll be okay and we'll do everything I can and it'll get better. But the reality is there are points in crisis where you cannot provide that. That's a feel better statement. That's not an honest statement. So how can you stick with the honest statement and allow that empathy to come out in the presence that you give and the quickness with which you respond? And humble, were you humble? Did we accept our own mistake? Or did we let it just boil out around us? Um, what, and do we want to be humble? I mean, I guess this is a good question um, as well. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you so much for your time today. Um, you have freedom to um, either schedule an hour with me or I can put you on my cr um, critical mention as an alternative. I have this URL 143jsr-strategies.com, which is like where you can schedule something with me, or that's my email, which you're welcome to reach out. And I know we have a QA and a as well, but um, I just want to appreciate, I just want to acknowledge each of you. It's a gift that you've spent this time today to sort of grow your business. That's such an amazing thing. It's a real gift that you did it with us. So Thank uh, you, Elizabeth, do you want me to show the last slides or do you, do you have them? Um, no, we're good. Thank you so much, Jessica, for your valuable insight and your knowledge, expertise. We appreciate your time with us. Um, if anyone has any questions, now would be a great time. You can show your face. We encourage you to, you know, let us see your beautiful face. Um, and yeah, ask any questions. We have, you know, some time um, or, you know, we can indulge in a conversation. Uh, in the meantime. So Sharon, did you have any questions? I just wanted to say thank you, Jessica. Um, I was there to listen. So um, thank you for answering my range of questions. I also enjoyed your website and the case studies that you put up. Um, and what you said today does reflect what you have on your website and the clients that you have and how you, how you 
put together a story for some very difficult issues. Um, and Sharon, thank you. It made my whole day. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you have to be, make issues relatable to people. Um, waste management isn't something that's always easy to humanize. It's not easy to take Volkswagen, which was in a very bad position with the state of California and come out on this end where you're doing something for the future of energy of California. Oh man, I was so excited to see you here. I was like, oh my <laughs> gosh, what a gift. Is, and if there's any other like um, suggestions or recommendations you have, because this is your career, I'm really following in your footsteps. Well, you know, it's true. I mean, you do your best to, to speak the truth to a reporter, even if you don't know the answer. And even if you're going to get the answer and between that point where you're getting the answer and you're talking to your executive director or your board of directors to impress upon them why you think this is the way to go. Because if you don't speak the truth now, um, it does later down the road, it could um, prove, <laughs> prove disastrous. Mm -hmm. developing that relationship right now yeah mm -hmm. I love your questions about examples and I think I might be a stronger advocate for my company if I had more examples of times when someone didn't tell the truth early on and someone did um, because mm -hmm. I think in a lot of uh, business owner minds if if you can hide it you should and that is sometimes the truth, and it is often not. So what's the, what's the, what's the give and take? And I only say that it might sound shocking, but you know, even as a human, like if I break the cookie jar and I can hide it and get it done and cleaned up before anybody sees, mm -hmm. and like get a new cookie, get new cookies in there, then a, then that's like a natural human tendency. And so we tend to make that same sometimes mistake with our companies. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. I don't know what you think about that, but I learned from you today ways that I can come up with more examples. So when I come to my leadership in any business, I can say, here's six examples when it didn't go so well. And I do know there's that give and take with reporters. My husband um, is a, a reporter and he'll tell me how um, he'll give someone a break in how he might write a story because they tried their best to, you know, give a truthful account and didn't try and hide versus someone who is very obvious in avoiding someone or not. Um, I, yeah, I, I would just, you know, hiding behind, um, you know, false narratives. He, he does give people a benefit of the doubt mm -hmm. because they're human too, right? <laughs> So I enjoyed the conversation. So thank you. Thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you for coming. Yeah. And thank thanks for so checking much. our website out. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Thank you so much, Sharon, um, for starting a conversation and for your own insights. You know, you've been um, doing this reporting for I mean, years. And so we, we thank you for, for being here. Um, Jessica, thank you so much again. For joining us and thank you to everyone for participating in today's virtual training to our sponsors pepsico verizon pg and e east west bank and ease and our partners impact foundry jsr strategies the sacramento mbda covid 19 specialty center and national ace thank you all for your support and your contributions to this initiative um, really quickly i just want to go through some upcoming event announcements. We have another webinar coming up on Wednesday, June 29th at 1 p.m. Um, you won't want to miss this um, conversation either where we'll be taking a look at our, at our or the AAPI community's resiliency. Um, during this event, we'll discuss stories and testimonies of, a, of the AAPI community with our speaker, Jim Tabucci. Um, so tune in and thank you again for your time and most of all for your support for our small business owners, API community and our communities of color. 
We look forward to seeing you all at our next event. Thank you so much.